Hello everybody and welcome to part 29 of our machine learning with Python tutorial series and a continuation on the support vector machine. In this tutorial we're going to be talking about what to do when the realities of the world hits you. So up until this point our support vector machine has been working with linearly separable data. Now, unfortunately, it's just the case that in the real world, you are almost certainly not going to get linearly separable data. It's just highly unlikely. So, for example, what we have here is a two-dimensional feature set with the classes plotted on. You got the plus class and the minus class here. And of course, if I was to ask you, okay, what, what are the support vectors, right? You would probably not know. If I asked you, what's the best separating hyperplane? We, we just don't have one. It's not possible right now with the way that we're looking at things. Now, one of the most crude options that you might have at your disposal is to simply take another perspective and literally add a new dimension. So you could add a new dimension using all kinds of functions, right? So right now we've got x1 and x2. You could say something like x3 equals, um, it could be something as simple as uh, x1, x2. Just x1 times x2. So you could do something like that and, and boom, you've got a third dimension. Now the problem happens, however, when you are working with, let's say, feature sets that are, maybe let's, let's say you're doing image analysis or video analysis, basically the same thing. You might have hundreds of features or thousands of features even. And so looking at the data we have right here, Obviously, we just added one more dimension. We went from two dimensions to three dimensions. Not a horrible thing, but actually, in reality, that's a 50% increase in, in data, right? And what was that main downfall of the support vector machine? Oh, right. It was training it because if you have a large size of data, it is extremely cumbersome to train it because of that quadratic programming and optimization problem that we have. So, is it really a great idea to be multiplying our data set maybe by uh, 1.5x, right? Uh, probably not. I mean, we want to avoid doing that because we're just we're weakening the algorithm uh, on ourselves. So we don't really want to want to do that if we don't have to. Now, what if I told you that you could do calculations in plausibly infinite? dimensions. Or maybe even better put, what if I told you that you could have calculations done for you in plausibly infinite dimensions without ever actually having to visit those dimensions yourself and without having to pay the processing costs? That would be pretty impressive, right? Well, it turns out that you might be able to do that. And the way that we would do that if we could do that is by using kernels. So most people, I think, probably first come into contact and maybe lastly, including firstly, come into contact with kernels with the support vector machine and, and may find themselves under the impression that kernels are really just used and it's just like something used in a support vector machine and that's it. That's not the case. A kernel is a similarity function. It takes two inputs and outputs their similarity. Simple as that. Being that this is a machine learning tutorial, some of you might be thinking already, well, why don't people just use kernels as machine learning classifiers? And I would say that they do. It just so happens that we can actually use kernels to augment or add to our support vector machine, hopefully. And allow us to work with nonlinear data by transforming that nonlinear data to another dimension and finding a linear um, and creating a linear linearly separable situation so to speak uh, as hard as it might be to speak such a thing so keep in mind why this is so valuable right out of the gate because in that previous 
on that previous page, we were talking about, okay, well, if you have two-dimensional data that's not linearly separable, you could create a function that could create more dimensions for you that are based on those previous features, and it would be valid and statistically sound, but you would be paying a lot more in processing, 50% or even more. So consider, let's say, because it's not just the case you add one dimension, it's separable, right? It's like, what if you have 30 dimensions already? It, or is, it, is it likely that if you add one more dimension that you're going to get linear separate, uh, linearly separable data? Probably not. You're probably going to add more like 10 or 15 or maybe even more, right? You might actually have to add 100 dimensions before you actually get linearly separable data. Or maybe you have to add a million dimensions, right? This can get out of hand really, really fast. So anyways, back to kernels and back to me. What if I told you that you could do this uh, and not pay the price? So with kernels, there's really just one major element to kernels, and that is that they are done using inner product. And for the purposes of what we're going to be using them for and the purposes of this entire tutorial, what is inner product? What is dot product? How do they relate? They are the same thing. If you pull up NumPy right now, you make a couple of vectors and you do np dot inner or np dot um, dot. <laughs> you're going to find that the same data gives the exact same answers when you run that through. So just keep that in mind. You're going to hear, especially if you go to another source or you're coming from another source, some people say dot, some people say inner, and it's just the same thing. I, th I believe fundamentally you should be using the inner product. Uh, if, you're, if you're writing a paper on this, I think you, it's inner. But I could be totally wrong. You can look that up on your own. So the question is, can we use a kernel? And if so, how do we know that we can use a kernel? So to find out if we can use a kernel, we know that in order to use a kernel, we have to be able to use inner product. And then and the way that we can find out is basically we're trying to get to some sort of new dimensional space. So up to this point, we've been using, basically we're, we've got X, we're, we're dealing in an X space. Okay, because we're, our feature sets are, are denoted as X1, X2, and so on. Are, we already have a value for y, and that's the class. So, so the next most reasonable variable will be z for z space. So the question is, can we interchange x and z? Obviously, you know, fundamentally, we, we could do that, right? But is it is every interaction in our let's say our optimization algorithm and all that, and for everything for the support vector, is every interaction with the x space? a dot product or an inner product? Well, let's find out. So going back, let's let's start at the, at the end and kind of work our way backwards. So right away, like, let's say we've got an unknown feature set, which is uh, what we'll call it X for now, right? An unknown feature set is X. How did we determine what the classification was? Well, it was just simply, the classification was gonna be Y, and that was just Y equals the sign not the psi, <laughs> the sign of, and that was just w dot x plus b, right? And really, uh, if we're going to be perfect, I, I did warn you that I was not, we we're probably going to drop those bars pretty quick. But anyway, sign w x plus b. What's this? Well, hot diggity, that's a dot. So could we interchange x with some sort of z value? Absolutely, right? Because again, what is what is what is w dot x going to return to us? Isn't that going to return a vector, or is that going to return just a number, a scalar value? Well, it's going to return a scalar. So does it matter if x is uh, five dimensions or fifty dimensions? I realize I did a lowercase and a capital. Anyway, five dimensions or 50 dimensions, does it matter? No, it doesn't, because it's just going to return a scalar. So modifying x, you know, our x space to a z space, an unknown dimension space, is that going to have an effect on the classification algorithm, that sign algorithm? Nope, no problem there. Now, how about the constraints? Probably where a lot of people stopped watching the series. <laughs> so... Really, in reality, there are two major constraints. 
Now, we really just worked with one because we were able to get away with it. Uh, and, and we didn't do true quadratic programming. So first, let's look at that one. And then we'll go and deal with the other, the other constraint that we have to deal with. So the first constraint was the requirement that y sub i multiplied by x sub i w plus b minus 1 was greater than or equal to 0, right? And again, that's, uh, we didn't have, we don't have the dot there, but it's just kind of expected that you, you know that by this point. But anyway, that is, there's your dot. And since we're really focusing on the dot, I figure I might as well <laughs> make it explicit, right? And again, right, can we interchange x sub i with a theoretical z sub i? Yep, because that's a dot product, right? We got no problem replacing that. So that's one of the constraints. And what about that other constraint? Well, the other formal constraint was that basically, or it wasn't even really a constraint, it's just a, a value. Once we found, if you recall, the, the quadratic programming problem was basically going to give us some values for alpha. So that was going to be the value for eventually w. And that was going to eventually give us basically the sum over alpha i, y i, x i. Okay. And again, uh, I'll be good and try to stick my dots in there. Dot. There we go. Uh, again, x sub i, what's it doing? Looks like a dot to me. So yet again, we have confirmation that every interaction is a dot product. And if we go back to the really long equation, the first one that we wrote, what did we have at the very end of that? Well, it was L equals, hopefully I can fit it on here. Uh, that was gonna be the sum over alpha i minus one half, the double sum, and that was i, and then we said j, alpha i, alpha j, that double alpha, which was what was scared us away initially. And then y sub i, y sub j, dotted with x i, dotted with x j. Again, <laughs> right? And, and that was kind of how we, that was the equation that came before that w equals. But again, we find that it, we've, um, we, we, all of the interactions are a dot product, right? So, so we can get away with having no problem with kernels. So now what we need to do is actually kind of, is, is talk about what's an example of a kernel and actually kind of see with our eyeballs, one, how the kernel is going to transform a feature set that we have, and then two, actually work out the math to show you why, because so far I've shown you that, okay, this is how we know we can actually use a kernel, but I have yet to really show you how we can go out to, to more dimensions without actually paying any price. So I've said plausibly infinite. You're not always gonna go out to infinite dimensions. You might only go out to six dimensions or eight dimensions or whatever, but the main, the main value here is that you can go out to all those dimensions without actually paying the processing cost. And that's the entire reason why we're going to use kernels rather than some sort of function that just creates new dimensions like what we wrote out before. So that's what we're going to be talking about in the next tutorial is actually applying a kernel, working out that kernel by hand, and sh at truly showing it because we can actually do it with one of the kernels, which is a polynomial kernel. We can actually work that one out by hand and, and conceptualize how the kernel works. And then as we move on, there's some kernels that we really are not going to be able to really conceptualize, so we can't really do it. But anyways, at least one of them we'll do uh, so you can get the idea. And then finally, we will move over to Python and actually show an example of, of a kernel at work. So in summary, a kernel is really not something that's specific or unique to the support vector machine. It's just a similarity function. We can restate many of the machine learning algorithms or even create our own machine learning algorithms purely with kernels. So a kernel just takes two inputs and outputs the similarity of them using the inner product. Inner product is a projection 
of, let's say, x1 onto x2. Basically, how much overlapping do we have going on there, which is how and why it's considered to be a degree of similarity. So we know that we can use a kernel to help us transform our feature space, our x space, because every interaction with that feature space is an inner product reaction. So anyways, if you have any questions or comments or whatever up to this point, feel free to leave them below. Otherwise, as always, thanks for watching. Thanks for all the support subscriptions. And until next time.